Welcome to a discussion of radical fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, laissez-faire capitalism, and individual rights. The Yaron Brooks Show starts now. Good morning, or at least here in California, it's still morning. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, hopefully you're having a great weekend. Uh, so I guess the most uh, interesting story this week, and the, the one uh, that is still kind of... Uh, reverberating uh, through the media and through world events is uh, Donald Trump's announcement that the United States will now recognize Jerusalem as the capital uh, of Israel and will actually um, move its embassy uh, to uh, Jerusalem. This is something that almost every, I'd say every Republican uh, candidate for president over the last, I don't know how many decades has promised to do and then failed to do once in office. So, so uh, uh, in, in a big part of Trump's uh, speech where he announced this, he made a big deal out of exactly that fact, that he is fulfilling a promise for a, um, a, a president known for flip-flopping on so many different things, of changing his mind on so many different things. Um, uh, you know, he, he wants to emphasize when, when he's actually uh, doing something that he promised to do. And, uh, and, you know, Jerusalem is one of them. So I, I thought that would be a, a, good, uh, a good topic for us to discuss, partially because, you know, it, there's a little bit of a, a, a personal for me at stake here. For those of you who don't know, listening to me uh, here on The Blaze, uh, I was born in Jerusalem, uh, spent my first three and a half years of my life uh, in Jerusalem, this is uh, before the Six Day War. So I was born in West uh, West Jerusalem, in the uh, Israeli part of of Jerusalem, and uh, you know, to this, uh, uh, spent most of my life uh, in Israel, or most of my early life in Israel. I think I've spent now more years in the United States than I did uh, originally in Israel. But uh, so now I'm uh, I'm more American than anything else. But certainly. Uh, Suddenly, my early uh, my early days were all uh, in Israel. So uh, this is personal. I, in addition to that, Israel has an interesting status um, I, 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 for the United States in terms of uh, in terms of the way the United States treats Jerusalem. Uh, so I'm uh, I was born in Jerusalem. I have an American passport, and almost anybody who has an American passport, it says a, a country of birth. And it gives the country where you were born. If, if you were not born in the United States, it gives the country where you were born outside of the United States. Uh, I was born in Israel, in the city of Jerusalem. But the United States doesn't recognize Jerusalem as part of the state of Israel. The United States does not recognize Jerusalem as part of the state of Israel. Now, maybe that will now change now that it recognizes Jerusalem or that Trump has said that it will recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, but it has not recognized Jerusalem as um, a part of the state of Israel. So in my passport, it doesn't say place of birth Israel. It actually says place of birth Jerusalem, as if Jerusalem is some floating city not attached to any particular location. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about the history of why that is. Why is it that Jerusalem is now recognized by the United States, or, or I think about 160 countries in the world do not recognize Jerusalem as the capital of the state of Israel. So we'll talk a little bit about the history that, uh, that has led to that, you know, bizarre state of, state of affairs. Um, and uh, so, you know, I feel, so this is kind of a personal thing for me because uh, A, I was born there, B, my passport. I wonder if my passport is not going to change. And, uh, you know, and, and being uh, originally from Israel, I, I, you know, I have a certain uh, view of Jerusalem. I have a certain view of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which we're going to get into today uh, as part of this. So, so we're going we're gonna to spend a little bit of time, a little bit of history a little bit of analysis on, on the Israeli-Palestinian issue, a little bit of history about, uh, about Jerusalem and, um, you know, why it is that it's treated the way it is uh, and, and why it is that, uh, that to this day, it's, it's taken uh, until today, it's taken to uh, 2017 
70 years after the United Nations declared uh, that Israel was a was going to be a legitimate state, um, it's taken that long for Jerusalem to be recognized as the capital. And then we'll get into the 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 the, the value, the particular declaration that Donald Trump made. But let's let's start with with some um, some history for those of you who are interested, because it is also. 70 years, or was 70 years a couple of weeks ago, to the actual declaration of the creation of a so-called Jewish state, of the, of the uh, state of Israel in 1947. In 1947, this, the area, which is the state of Israel, was at the time occupied by the British. It was part of uh, the British Empire. It was, it was part, just as uh, much of the rest of the Middle East had been conquered by the British from the Ottoman Empire uh, uh, during World War I. And uh, during uh, the period between World War I and uh, post-World War II, the whole area was ruled by a British mandate, a mandate granted to the British by the United Nations. Now, I have a view of the United Nations which is not positive. I, I'm very anti-United Nations. I think it's an evil organization and and, uh, you know, we, we, we can get into the, why I believe the UN is uh, the evil organization that it is. But the fact is that in, um, in, in 1947, uh, the British basically went to the United Nations and said, we don't know what to do with this land, this land in, uh, between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River, the land that at the time was called Palestine, today is called Israel. We don't know what to do with this land. Uh, there are Jews there, 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 there are Arabs uh, there, and they, you know, they keep fighting between each other. And uh, the UN, you guys need to come up with a solution for how to deal with this. We British, we want out. We want to get out of here. We've had it with the Middle East. It's too complicated. It's too hard. And uh, we're leaving. We're leaving. So the United Nations, you need to solve this problem. Uh, so while the British did not leave... Literally then, they handed it over to the United Nations with the threat that if a solution wasn't found, they would indeed leave. And the solution in 1947 that was found was um, to partition this little sliver of land called Palestine at the time into two states, a Jewish state, which would be called Israel, and a, a, uh, a Palestinian state, which would be called Palestine. Um, both would be tiny. Both would have uh, borders that, you know, kind of made sense, kind of didn't. And as part of this whole thing, as part of this division of, Is of, of Israel into these two countries, two divisions, Jerusalem, which, um, which was not connected directly to this new Israel, Israeli state, Jewish state. Uh, Jerusalem, um, which would be plop in the middle of a, of a Palestinian era, was actually declared as an international state that did not belong to any particular state. So this was a, 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 a transnational international city that was not ruled by either Israelis or Palestinians. And this is to a large extent the origin of this idea that Israel, that Jerusalem is not the, uh, the capital of, uh, of Israel, and uh, it's not a capital of anybody, that it is this transnational, international state. Um, so that's kind of the, that, that's, that's historical of, of, in terms of, of where it came from. Now, how did, where did it go from there? That is, how did we get to where we are today, where uh, Israel not just has West Jerusalem, uh, it has the whole of Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, um, where, you know, the United States still hasn't recognized, or until Donald Trump did it last week, uh, Jerusalem as the capital. Well, what's the deal with all that? Well, we're going to cover that after we take a quick break here to, uh, to pay for the bills. Uh, so uh, we're going to take a quick b break. You're listening to Iran Book Show we're on the Blaze Radio Network, and we'll be right back. You're 
listening to the Yaron Brooks Show. All right, we're talking today about the Middle East, and uh, specifically we're talking about uh, Trump's decision uh, to, to make Jerusalem the capital. And I'm giving it a little bit of history lesson here, a little bit of history lesson in terms of why this is even an issue, how, how Jerusalem became an issue. And uh, as I mentioned early on, this is a little bit personal. I'm, uh, I'm from Jerusalem. I was born in Jerusalem. I know Jerusalem fairly well. Uh, I, I speak in Jerusalem about once a year when I travel to Israel and uh, give talks about capitalism and about, uh, about freedom and liberty. So uh, I have a personal connection to this one. But, um, uh, you know, so let's, let's talk about this. So we, 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 we said 1947, Israel is, is uh, the, the United Nations decide to take this British mandate and split it into two countries. Now, Remember, Israel is this tiny little sliver of a place. I don't know how many of you have ever visited Israel, and, and I highly recommend visiting Israel. It's a fascinating place, both in terms of ancient history, religious history, but also in terms of modern history. So many wars are being fought there. It, it, everywhere you go, there's something interesting to be seen. Uh, it's also an incredibly modern, uh, party, partying place. It's, it's a fun place. It's incredible, incredible in terms of the high-tech industry. Uh, every time I go there, every year I go to Israel, uh, you know, new, uh, new buildings are being built, new office towers, new uh, companies are being founded. Just an exciting, exciting place. I recommend everybody visit. But what I, the point I wanted to make was how tiny, tiny, tiny um, country it really is. Uh, it's, um, if you, if you think about it in terms of driving, Americans like driving and we, we think of things in terms of driving, the length of Israel, the total length of Israel is about a six hour drive, about a six hour drive. The width of Israel, if you had a highway that went from the Mediterranean to the Jordan river, it's like 40 minute drive. I mean, it's nothing. There's, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny Little country. Anyway, the UN partition, partitioned this tiny, narrow little country into two. And that was in November, I think on November 29th, uh, 1947, exactly 70 years ago. And what happened? What happened when, uh, when, uh, when this partition was announced, when this decision by the United Nations was announced? By the way, just an aside before we get to what, uh, it, it was a close vote. And the United States, it wasn't clear how the United States was going to vote. Um, the Soviet Union, then under Stalin, voted yes in favor of partitioning Israel, in, in favor of creating a, 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 an Israeli state. And um, the, the United States under, um, under uh, Truman was unsure about whether they, how they would vote. In the last minute, because, to a large extent, I think because the Soviet Union voted for, the United States also voted for, and they voted for because they were afraid that if they didn't, Israel would fall under the influence of the Soviet Union. Remember, the founders of Israel were, were, were all socialists, many of them former communists, many of them came from Russia. There were, there were strong ties between... Uh, certain people in the Soviet Union and uh, the leaders of the Israeli state. And there was a real risk that Israel would become part of the Soviet kind of satellite uh, country system. But, um, you know, so the United States decided to jump in, vote yes. Not, not because necessarily they had a huge belief that Israel was a country that should exist, uh, unfortunately, but more for kind of geopolitical reasons. Anyway, that night, when the, when the United Nations decision was announced, uh, Jews all over Israel went out into the streets and danced. And, and you could find pictures of this. I mean, it was massive celebration. I mean, here was a dream that many people, uh, many uh, Jews had had for 2,000 years of creating their own country. Here was an opportunity post-Holocaust, post-World War II, to actually create a country where Jews could defend themselves, defend themselves, against rampant anti-Semitism that, was, that, that he had obviously just generated a Holocaust that still existed in the world 
and and uh, here was an opportunity to actually engage in active self-defense, no longer be victims, no longer be sheep led into slaughter, but actually have your own country have the ability to defend yourself against the anti-Semitism that seems to be part of the world in which we live and, and seems to have always been a part of the world in which we live. And it was celebration, even though what they were given was a tiny sliver of land, even though it would, it would be incredibly difficult to defend that land because of how tiny and how disjointed it was. I mean, look it up. Uh, uh, go and look at the UN partition plan of 1947. Uh, you can find it, uh, I'm sure, online if you Google that. And you can find a map of it and you can see how, how ridiculously disjointed. And yet, there was celebration. Huge celebration. The following day, the Palestinians uh, basically uh, announced their view of the UN partition plan by launching military attacks on Jewish settlements on Jewish uh, villages, towns, uh, all over, all over what was then Palestine under British occupation. So the Palestinian rejected, rejected wholeheartedly, at least the Palestinian leadership, I think the Palestinian people probably cared less, but the Palestinian leadership rejected wholeheartedly the UN partition plan. They rejected the idea of Jews being there. They rejected the idea of there being a Jewish state, of, a, of a, that there being a, 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 an Israeli state. They rejected that, and they turned to violence to combat it. Uh, by the way, if you have any questions on, uh, on the history, if you have any questions on Trump's decision, if you have any questions on Jerusalem, on any of this stuff, feel free to call in 888-900-3393. 888-900-3393. And, and I know somebody tried to call earlier and, and uh, there was no answer. Keep trying. Uh, it must have been a glitch in the system, but, but keep trying. Uh, there are people answering the phone. So 888-900-3393. For any questions related to, to the history or to Jerusalem or to the United Nations or to any of these, uh, any, any of the stuff we're talking about right now. And we're going we're gonna to talk about this probably for the first hour. Um, uh, there's enough content here to really get into it. And, and hopefully the history is interesting because I think most people don't need, know the history. I, I know certainly most young people have no clue about the history. I mean, one of the, my arguments against, against the legitimacy of a Palestinian state today, one of my arguments against the idea that the Palestinians are legitimate negotiating party today is that at every opportunity they have had, for 70 plus years, the Palestinians have rejected those opportunities, have turned their backs on them, and have always resorted to violence. Have always resorted to violence when offered peace, when offered their own state, when offered the opportunity to live side by side with Israel. And and it it started, it actually started before 1947, but Officially, it started in 1947 when the Palestinians completely rejected the UN partition plan and launched basically violence against the Jews living in Israel. Now, this violence continued from uh, November 1947 through May of 1948. And uh, in May of 1948, the British, who were... Who, uh, who, uh, in charge of this area, who had a mandate. Again, this is this is a territory that they had um, conquered during World War One. And, and again, why did they conquer it? They conquered it because the uh, the Turks, the Ottoman Empire, entered the war on the side of the Germans, and uh, they lost. They lost. So uh, what we had is uh, is a. Um, you know, is, is a basically a war, a war between the Palestinians and the, and the uh, Jews in, uh, in Palestine at the time. And um, this, this war continued until, about, until May of 1948. In May of 1948, the British announced that they were leaving, that they have had it, that they were not going to try to continue to bring peace to this area, but they were going to leave. And 
Ben Gurion, the founder of the State of Israel, uh, together with other political leaders, announced the establishment of the State of Israel. Uh, that uh, with the leaving of, of uh, w- with the fact that they, the British were leaving, the State of Israel would be created. The next day, armies from seven, I think it was seven, seven, let's see, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, and I'm missing a country, but I know it was seven countries, Arab countries, Muslim countries, invaded. Not, by the way, not by the way, to establish a Palestinian state. No, no. But each, because each wanted a piece of this ancient land, each wanting a piece of uh, this sliver, sliver of land um, on the Mediterranean, between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River. I mean, uh, Jordan wanted it, Egypt wanted it. It would have been interesting if Israel had lost that war if they'd still be fighting, if, if, if all the Arab states would still be fighting over that piece of land today? Probably. Probably. Because it wasn't clear who was going to get what. Uh, they all invaded with the idea of killing the Jews, kicking them out into the sea, destroying any hopes for a Israeli state. Israel fought back. And I think you, 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 know, you know who won that war. Um, Israel won the war, ultimately kicked, pushed back the forces of all those countries, pushed back Palestinian forces, actually expanded on the territory that the United States partition plan had allocated for it, expanded in a war of self-defense, created a, a, a landmass that was much more easily defendable. The only portion of land uh, that was not uh, taken between between the Mediterranean and the um, and the uh, Jordan River was what today is called the West Bank, uh, and the West Bank uh, of the Jordan River was occupied by the Jordanians, who did not turn it into a Palestinian state. By the way, into the Jordanians and uh, the Gaza Strip, which uh, is in the news again today, uh, because they they are they are. Uh, launching rockets into Israel from the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip was occupied by the Egyptians. So other than those two pieces, tiny little pieces, slivers of land, the rest of what had been partitioned between the Jews and the Palestinians was now occupied by the Israelis and annexed into an Israeli state, as it should have been. 30. If the Palestinians had accepted the partition plan, that would have been the state of Israel. They did not. They launched violent attacks against the Israelis. Israel acted in self-defense, and therefore all the land it occupied should be theirs. They also took over Jerusalem, and we'll get to Jerusalem when we come back after the break. We'll also get to, to Luko's calling from Switzerland to talk about the United Nations, and we'll take that call when we come back right after this. You're clear. You're on. On the Blaze Radio Network. The Yaron Rook Show. Hey, everybody. We're doing a bit of a history lesson today. We're going over a little bit of the history surrounding the whole Jerusalem issue. And uh, why, why for 70 years, or almost 70 years, uh, Jerusalem has not been declared the capital of uh, the state of Israel. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the consequences of uh, Trump declaring it such, uh, maybe later in the show. Uh, before I, I continue kind of the, with, with the history lesson, which I, I hope you guys are enjoying, and, and feel free to call in if you disagree or if you want to take the Palestinian side of this story or if you want to... Uh, I don't know, just ask a question about uh, something I haven't covered or I have covered, 888-900-3393. And we're going to go to, uh, to Luca from Switzerland who, who wants to ask about the United Nations. Hey, Luca, how's it going? Hey, Aaron, great to be contributing finally uh, with a <laughs> question live after following your show for the last uh, couple of years. Well, I appreciate that. I have, thanks. appreciate uh, uh, what you mentioned with the United Nations in the uh, beginning of your segment. I have a deeper question. Do we really need United Nations at all? 
Uh, can we do without them? And could, could Trump swing things in a different way? We've seen that the United Nations has been very controversial throughout history with this Israel decision that they took. And now they swung the other way because they're very much anti-Semitic. And uh, Ilel Neuer and uh, UN Watch are doing an amazing work here in Geneva to basically denounce all yep. of what they're doing against the state of Israel. Yep. Yeah. What can you tell us? Oh, absolutely. Look, uh, I, I think the United Nations is an abomination. Uh, I think the first thing, I, one of the first things I would do foreign policy-wise if I became president is kick him out of New York and, and basically withdraw all U.S. support from the United Nations. Uh, the, the United Nations has always been an abomination. So we, we can talk about its current history or its recent history with, uh, you know, the United Nations... Um, uh, civil uh, civil rights commission uh, having human rights commission having Syria and Saudi Arabia and Venezuela and Iran and China on it, uh, uh, you know these are countries that violate the individual rights and the civil rights and the human rights of their citizens on a daily basis. Yet they are there to judge other people's other people's uh, uh, you know how they treat their own civilians. It's just it's just an absurdity and an evil absurdity at that. So uh, I believe that the United States should be shut down. Now, now you might now let me go historically. Um, at its founding, think about the founding. Think about a, 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 a system, a, an organization that has as equal partners the United States and the Soviet Union. The United States and the Soviet Union now. The United States that, that symbolizes at least and, and, and at least in some of its history lives up to the ideas of liberty and individual rights and freedom and, uh, and, and, and capitalism and sitting right next to it with equal, equal veto power in the Security Council, equal voting power, equal everything is Stalin, Joseph Stalin, responsible for the deaths of hundreds of millions of people. Uh, well, tens of millions of people, not hundreds, tens of millions of people. And he gets to veto anything that's passed. And then later on, uh, starting in the 1960s, you have Mao Zedong sitting at the uh, you know, Security Council and being able to veto resolutions and having the same decision authority as the United States. So there is no international organization that is valid in which the United States is sitting at the same table with the same power. As, the, as Stalin and Mao Zedong. It, or, or imagine a world in which Hitler is a member of the United Nations. Hitler's Germany. Why not? If, if communism, if the communists are members of the United Nations, why can't Hitler be a member of the United Nations? I mean, it's a, it's, it's a sovereign country. It would be recognized as a sovereign country by the United Nations. What, are they going to kick out Hitler's Germany? No, it's anybody can, anybody can be part of it. So, by definition, an organization that unites all countries under one banner, no matter what the moral status of those countries is, an organization that has Israel under its banner and Saddam Hussein or the Iranian theocracy or the Saudi Arabian theocracy under the same banner is an illegitimate, immoral, evil institution that should not be taken seriously by anybody. I, and, and I think that, that they're not to be taken seriously to begin with. If you think that Saudi Arabia plays a big role in, you know, in women rights, absolutely, travesty. Exactly. So how can Saudi Arabia be on the Human Rights Commission when it treats women the way it treats women? What what say they, they can, can the Saudis today. have with regard to women's human rights? If, if if this is the status of human rights within their own within their own culture, if people who are accused of blasphemy are stoned or, or whipped. Or, or, or sent to jail for the rest of their life. They, talk about the right to free speech doesn't exist in Saudi Arabia, and yet Saudi Arabia is on the, on the Human Rights Commission. So it's things like that that make it an institution that must be banned, that, must be, that the United States should have nothing, zero, zilch to do with. We should not be funding it. We should not be contributing to it. We should not be supporting it in any, any way. And it, so... Would you, would you think that the Trump is trying waters with uh, pulling out of the Paris Accord 
and what he will be doing with UNESCO also pulling out of the funding of, of that. No, and I mean, America's mean, pulled out of UNESCO in the past, but it hasn't really done anything beyond that. Uh, and, and there's no indication that, that, that Trump is going to pull the, United, the U.S. out of the United Nations. He's put, you know, a, a pretty powerful spokesman. I think Nikki Haley is, is a pretty significant person at the United Nations. She's actually fairly good uh, in terms of it. But look, Donald Trump doesn't have a consistent principled foreign policy. It's not like he has a vision of America first. He says American first, but it's an empty slogan when Donald Trump says it. And a real America first foreign policy, yes, would have the United States withdraw completely from an organization that puts America last, which is the United Nations. It, it, it's an anti-American uh, anti-American interest organization. So the problem is that we have a president who doesn't have a coherent foreign policy. Now, neither did any other president. Uh, but Trump is less coherent than any other president, but, but no president for, since World War II, in my view, has had a coherent, systematic, pro-American foreign policy. And, and that's, that's, that's true of even Reagan. Go I think ahead. I'd like to mention, and uh, you're probably going to cover that uh, further today, is the shift that we've seen between Israel and Saudi Arabia and the possible role that uh, Trump and Kushner played there and, and what that uh, might mean moving forward. Thanks for your answers. Well, sure. Thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks Lucas, for, for calling. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there is a shift going on in the Middle East. I, I think that, that the United States is playing a very small role in it. Uh, I, I think at the end of the day, uh, the cooperation between uh, the Saudis and the Israelis goes back uh, 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 probably uh, five, six years uh, uh, since the Saudi Arabia has really identified Iran as, as the major threat uh, in the Middle East and identified the United States as basically a weak, impotent power in the Middle East. I think once it became clear that the only winner in Iraq, post-Iraq war, post the United States, uh, you know, supposedly winning that war was Iran. I think the Saudis have come to the realization as a consequence of that, that Israel is their only ally or the only, the only party that they can trust in terms of, uh, in terms of fighting off the Iranians. Uh, you know, and I, and, and I don't want to get sidetracked here to talk about this, but look, the winner in the Middle East since 9-11, the overwhelming winner uh, in the Middle East over, since 9-11 has been Iran. Iran, uh, the 5,000 American kids who died in uh, Iraq to overthrow Saddam Hussein and to bring democracy to the Middle East, basically unfortunately, tragically, treasonously, maybe, of, of our leadership, their death at the end of the day, the only beneficiaries of their death, the people who have actually benefited, are the Iranians. Not America. America is not safer because of their deaths. The Iranians are more powerful. The Iranians are stronger. The Iranians control huge swaths of the Middle East now. Iran has been systematically winning. Now, it can't win by itself. In, in, if, if you remember the Iran-Iraq war, some people may, might remember that during the 1980s. Iran -Iraq, they, they fought a stalemate. Iran could not defeat Iraq and could not take over Iraq and could not dominate Iraq. So it basically, in a sense, roped in the United States to fight the war for it. The United States defeated Iraq for the Iranians and then handed Iraq on a silver platter to Iran. Iran now controls uh, it, it, the vast amounts of has vast amounts of influence in Afghanistan, of course, in Iran itself, in Iraq. The government in Iraq is beholden to the Iranians. Into Syria, where where Assad is an Iranian puppet at this point, all the way into Lebanon, where the Lebanese government is controlled by Hezbollah, which is an arm a terrorist arm of the Iranian government. So it controls all of that. Plus, it is fighting a war to take over Yemen, uh, fighting against the Saudis. The Saudis have realized that uh, 
that Iran controls all of this, that they're basically surrounded by, by, by Iranians, almost surrounded by Iranians, and therefore have aligned with Israel. It has nothing to do with Kushner. It has nothing to do with Trump. It has everything to do with the survival of the Saudi regime. It, it, again, people don't know this, but, but the part of Saudi Arabia where the oil is has actually a majority Shiite in that part of Saudi Arabia. Shiites are aligned with Saudi Arabia, with uh, Iran. So again, uh, the Saudis are threatened, and that's why they're turning to Israel for help. It, it, again, nothing to do with this administration. This administration has no foreign policy strategy in the Middle East. If anything, all this administration has done is followed the path of the Obama administration in handing over big swaths of the Middle East to the Iranians, to our biggest enemies in the Middle East. All right, we're going to take a quick break here. Uh, when we be back, we'll go to Sandy from Troy, who's calling in to ask about the Palestinians. Uh, and you're listening to your unbooked show on the Blaze Radio Network. We'll be right back. All right, we're doing a, a bit of a history lesson today and uh, discussing a, a wide uh, array of issues from the United Nations to the very existence of the United Nations to uh, uh, really uh, all motivated uh, by uh, Trump's decision uh, this week to, um, to announce that uh, we're going to move the embassy, the United States is going to move the embassy to Jerusalem, a, a, a decision that Really, uh, United States president should have done uh, made a long, long time ago, but uh, but uh, did not. So uh, um, we will uh, hopefully uh, it, it will it will actually come to fruition, and we will see uh, the embassy actually move, and we will see a, a full recognition by the United States of the uh, the you know the the capital of Israel being, uh, being Jerusalem. All right. Um, we have Sandy on the line who's calling in. So hi, Sandy. How's it going? Hi, thank you, Yaron. Sure. I was wondering, um, where, how did the Palestinians, Palestinians rather, be, been, uh, created? From my understanding, like kind of prior to the land being divvied out, that there was no Palestinians, that they were sort of just, whether they came from the Philip, I'm sorry, my, my throat is so sore. Um, but basically that's it. When and how did Palestinians uh, start being there? Because I well, understood there was yeah. none until then. No, I mean, there were always, look, there were always Arabs in the area that we call Palestine or the, in the area that we call Israel today, there were always Arabs there uh, for, for thousands of years. I mean, uh, since, uh, uh, since the Jews, in a sense, were thrown out by the Romans, uh, there were people living there. Uh, they lived there under various, uh, under the Arab Empire when the Arabs controlled it, uh, uh, under the Ottoman Empire when the Ottomans controlled it. And then right. under, under British mandate, when, when the British controlled it. So there were always Arabs there. Um, they didn't necessarily call themselves Palestinians, but, that, you know, so what? Uh, uh, you know, the, the, there, were, there were no Jordanians in that sense, or Syrians or Lebanese. Uh, you know, the whole idea of nationalism, the whole idea of states was a relatively modern phenomenon, and really a European phenomenon, and a European idea that, uh, that many of these people... Uh, that the Palestinians embraced at some point and created their own uh, a national movement. Uh, that national movement uh, was, um, uh, you know, f really established, really got going in the early part of the 20th century, just like many national movements all over the Middle East and all over the world got going uh, during that period of time. So I, I, don't, I don't think denying the existence of the Palestinian people as a people, gives us anything. The Arabs. Now, many okay. of them came into what's today called Palestine. 
Many of them came into the, during the 20th century as Jews were developing the economy of, uh, of, of what is today Israel and establishing industry and building up and drying swamps and doing things. Many of them came there to get jobs uh, as, as uh, in a sense, immigrants. They came in from Syria and Lebanon and Jordan and places like that. But, all right, the Jews all came from all over, all over other countries as well. It's not like the Jews were born there. They came from Europe and they came from Morocco and Iraq and, and uh, all other countries uh, across the Middle East. Uh, so I don't think it helps to say that there's no such thing as the Palestinian people. The, the, okay. Yeah, so it, it, that's not uh, helpful. One more question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, how, I mean, the, the history of the Jews goes back so long. Why are they denying that they were ever there and it was never their land? Because uh, history shows that that they were in Israel way back when. Sure, but what does that mean? I mean, I don't like the historical arguments. I mean, we were all in different places uh, 2,000 years ago. Do we really want to go back 2,000 years and say, where were your ancestors and where were my ancestors? Give them all their little countries back. If they, they weren't even really countries 2,000 years ago, what were they exactly? I, I think it's I think very, it very, very <laughs> dangerous to do that and very complicated to do that. So I, I don't think it's, it's legitimate to approach... Um, you know, if you will, to approach the whole issue as this was two thousand years ago, and uh, uh, we're gonna we're gonna mimic the world as it was two thousand years ago. Not a helpful, not helpful, I think, for anybody uh, to do that in terms of uh, in terms of deciding which peoples belong. I mean, even if you go back 60, 70 years, you're gonna find it very difficult to place people and where do they belong i mean it, 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 do we want to give uh, america back to uh, the indians do we uh, do we want to give uh, mexico back to the mayans i mean it's just it's just impossible to do you can't do it it's 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 and it's to a large extent it's a it would be it would be a waste of time so i don't believe the jews have an historical claim on palestine because they were there 2000 years ago it's meaningless it's meaningless to the does, uh, you know, uh, um, I don't know, do the Mongol hordes have a claim against uh, half of the uh, known world because they occupied it at some point? No, I mean, I, I, I just don't buy those kind of arguments. I, I think Israel, and, and I'll, I'll try to end on this point and then come back to Jerusalem after the break. I thought I could get all this done in an hour, but it seems like, uh, thank you, Sandy. Uh, thanks for calling. I really appreciate it. Um, I think the Jews' claim on Israel is the fact that they built it, they created it, and, and they didn't just build and create anything. They didn't build and create an autocracy or theocracy or, 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 or some horrible state in which people are whipped, in which people are, uh, uh, are denied their, their yeah, rights. That's... Quite the contrary. They created a, a country that respects, for the most part, rights, that respects property rights, that respects individual rights, that respects freedom of religion. They respect the uh, ability of people to live their lives as they see fit that, that is not a dictatorship. So they created a free country. I think qua free country, it has a right to exist. Um, I think the reason it has a right to exist as a, a Jewish country is because Jews are persecuted everywhere. Jews are killed everywhere. Anti-Semitism still exists in much of the world. History has shown us that um, uh, that anti-Semitism keeps popping back into the dialogue. And, and these people who have murdered and, and, and killed minute. and destroyed over and over again throughout human history need a place where they can protect themselves and defend themselves. In a world with no anti-Semitism, I don't believe in a Jewish state any more than I believe in a, any kind of ethnic group state. But in a world with anti-Semitism in which we live, I, I think Israel is different. Uh, and therefore, it should be the one ethnic state that I would, uh, not ethnic state really, but, but religious, cultural, ethnic state uh, that, that I think needs to exist. Because otherwise, 20. Jews will be killed like they have been killed uh, throughout human history. All right, when we come back after this uh, uh, news break, 
We're going to talk a little bit more about Jerusalem, about the history of it, and um, about the consequence of this decision to uh, move the embassy. We'll be right back after this break. Be clear. Principles of rational self-interest and individual rights on your radio. It's the Yaron Brooks Show on the Blaze Radio Network. Welcome to a discussion of radical fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, laissez-faire capitalism, and individual rights. The Yaron Brooks Show starts now. All right, we've been talking about uh, Jerusalem and Israel and, uh, you know, a bit of a history lesson. Hopefully, uh, hopefully once in a while, these history lessons, uh, you guys enjoy them. I don't think you get this kind of content anywhere else, uh, particularly from somebody who has intimate knowledge and intimate experience of this, not just because I've studied the history, and, and, uh, but because I've experienced it. I, I, uh, I was born in Jerusalem in 1961 when, it, when Jerusalem was still partitioned between West and East Jerusalem. I was born in the West. Um, and, uh, you know, I've lived through the unification of Jerusalem in 1967, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, have uh, used to know Jerusalem really, really well. Used to, uh, 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 you know, tour there quite a bit. And uh, lived in Israel for most of my early life, at least. Now, uh, I'm getting to the age where I can say I've lived longer in the United States than I have in, uh, in Israel. So I'm... Uh, I am now uh, more of an American than I am an Israeli, but um, but I do have the background, and and uh, as as many of you know, served in the Israeli military and military intelligence, so know know the uh, know the uh, region a little bit, just a little bit. All right, uh, for those of you, by the way, interested in um, in uh, the history of the Middle East uh, and uh, the history, particularly of uh, Islamic terrorism. In the Middle East, I have two courses that I've done that are available via podcast. If you subscribe to my podcast on iTunes, the Iran Brook Show podcast, you can get these courses. One is a course on the history, short history of the Middle East. I think it's uh, five lectures, and another one is a short history of Islamic totalitarianism. Uh, both of those courses available on um, my uh, website, iranbrookshow.com. Also available uh, through my podcast. Just go to iTunes and look for Iran Brook Show. Uh, and uh, subscribe, and you can and you just scroll down the podcast, and you'll find those podcasts. Uh, you know those two courses. I think really give you a perspective on the Middle East that you will not get anywhere else. Give you a real history of the Middle East that you will not. That you would have to spend, you know, uh, dozens and dozens of hours uh, to try to replicate yourself. So a real shortcut for those of you interested. Um, please go and and consume and enjoy. All right, uh, so we kind of ended up the history. We had some diversions about the Palestinian people. We had some diversions around the United Nations. But basically, coming out of 1948, out of the War of Independence of 1948, Israel controlled the western part of Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, which is the old city. All the holy sites uh, were controlled by the Jordanians. By the way, all the Jews who lived in East Jerusalem were kicked out by the Jordanians and, uh, and sent to, um, you know, sent to the, uh, to the eastern side and, uh, or sent to the western side. Uh, the, you, Jews were not allowed to worship at the, uh, at the um, Wailing Wall uh, during this period. There was no freedom of religion uh, in Jerusalem under the Jordanian control. Jordan also did not create a Palestinian state in the West Bank when it controlled that area. Neither did the Egyptians create a Palestinian state in the Gaza Strip when they controlled the Gaza Strip. Instead, in 1967, uh, uh, a war was uh, launched. It it was initiated by uh, Nasser, uh, the Egyptians amassing troops on the Israeli border. Israel preemptively struck the Egyptians, begged the Jordanians to stay out of the war, but Jordan thought that this was their opportunities to basically destroy Israel completely, take Jerusalem and, and create a unified city under Jordanian rule, destroy the, the country completely. The same happened with the Syrians. The Syrians uh, started uh, moving down the Golan Heights and, and, uh, and shooting from the tops and invading, uh, invading Israel. Israel fought on three fronts, uh, fought the Egyptians in the Sinai, uh, fought the uh, Jordanians in, in Jerusalem and the West Bank, and the Syrians in the Golan Heights. 
uh, won all three war all th- on all three fronts in six days. It's called the Six Day War, 1967. As part of that, Israel took control over the Gaza Strip, over the West Bank, and the whole of Sinai, as well as the Golan Heights. Uh, those of you, again, who know a little bit of history, the, the, the uh, Sinai Peninsula was returned to the Egyptians as part of the peace deal cut with Sadat in the late 1970s and then early 1980s, Israel withdrew from the Sinai. Uh, so that, uh, but the West Bank and Jerusalem are still occupied, if you will, by Israel, although Israel has annexed, annexed the uh, East Jerusalem and, and declared Jerusalem as a whole, its capital. And, uh, well, we can get, I don't want to go into the Gaza Strip, but the Gaza Strip is what withdrew from, left it to the Palestinians, and Hamas today controls the Gaza Strip. So you have kind of a big picture. Israel still has the Golan Heights, luckily, because given, given that now Iran is on, on, on the border there, if they had given back the Golan Heights, the Iranians would be looking down into Israel from the Golan Heights. It would just be a, a stri- strategic military strategic nightmare uh, to have returned the Golan Heights uh, given the hostility uh, of Syria and the hostility of particularly the Iranians now uh, and their presence over there. All right, so here we are post-1967. So now Israel occupies the whole of Jerusalem, declares the whole of Jerusalem its capital. By the way, Israeli parliament has always been in Jerusalem, at least since 1949, I think, has always been in Jerusalem. Uh, Israel has always counted Jerusalem as its capital, um, and uh, but the United States has refused to do so, as have most of the co- countries in the world, partially going back to the 1947 idea that Jerusalem should be an international city, should not be ruled by anybody. And then post-1967, post-Israel taking the whole of Jerusalem, the Palestinian claim, particularly I'd say over the last 30 years, that East Jerusalem is going to be their capital one day, and the United States not wanting to get into the middle of East Jerusalem, West Jerusalem, Palestinians, Israelis, who owns it, who should have it, which part, should it be partitioned, should it all be under Israeli rule, should, it be, should we go back to the old UN idea of an international city that is not ruled either by the Palestinians or by the Israelis? And indeed, one of the indications, one of the real weaknesses of, of Trump's uh, announcement with regard to the Jerusalem, moving to Jerusalem, is, uh, you just heard it on the news, uh, Rex Tillerson just said, look, this says nothing about the final solution that we envision for Jerusalem. This is nothing about whether Jerusalem would be partitioned or not. This is nothing about the final status of Jerusalem. All right, so what's the point, right? What's the point? Now, I believe, and I don't have... We don't have a lot of time for me to get into this, but I believe that the only way you will get peace among, between Israelis and Palestinians is when Israel recognizes that it is engaged in a war of survival, something the Palestinians realize clearly because they, 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 they are engaged in that war and they, they clearly right now are engaged in a war to, to destroy Israel and to kill as many Jews as possible and to destroy the state of Israel. This is explicitly the policy of the Hamas, they don't hide it, and implicitly the policy of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO, they hide it, but it, 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 not in internal communication, they just try to hide it from the world. The world plays dumb by pretending that Palestinians actually want peace, when clearly they do not. Now I'm talking here about the leadership, I'm talking about a significant proportion of the Palestinian people. It, it, clearly I'm not talking about every Palestinian, there are plenty of Palestinians who would love peace, and who would in a moment, recognize the state of Israel. Actually, many of them would like to live in the state of Israel. They'd like to move and live in the state of Israel because Israel treats its Arab population, its Muslim population, better than any country in the Middle East treats its Muslim population. (laughs) That's true. The Muslim population in Israel gets to vote. The Muslim population in, in, uh, in Israel has right to free speech. The Muslim population in Israel has property rights. Now, I'm not saying Israel's perfect. There are a lot of things that Israel does with its Muslim population, which I find offensive and wrong. But they are treated better than Muslims in any other country in the Middle East. Better than in Egypt, better than in Jordan, better than in Syria. Indeed, uh, many Arab Muslims that I knew in Israel used to bless Allah that they were born 
in Israel because they knew that they were freer in Israel than any of their cousins who lived in Jordan or Syria or Lebanon or, or Iraq or any of those other places. So what the move to Jerusalem should have entailed, it should have not just been, we're going to move the embassy to Jerusalem, pounding my chest while saying, look, I finally fulfilled a, I, I fulfilled a promise that I made during the campaign. No other, no other Republican has done that. Look, look how great I am. And then go on and say, well, but, you know, we still recognize the rights of the Palestinians and there's going to be, you know, we recognize the possibility of a two-state solution and the Palestinian Israelis are going to have to negotiate and ending the speech with God bless the Palestinians, God bless the Israelis, God bless America as if they're all moral equals. No, what a proper speech for principled foreign policy would have been a complete moral condemnation of the Palestinians and the Palestinian leadership a complete unequivocal support for the moral right of Israel to exist and to thrive and to be successful and to do whatever was necessary to secure the rights of its own citizens, to protect itself in self-defense, without any qualms, without any hesitation, and declare that the final, whatever the final negotiation between Israel and the Palestinians, it has to secure Israel and the Jerusalem as long as the Israelis believe that Jerusalem is its capital, the Americans will support that decision. There is, America cannot be partial here, cannot be indifferent. They are good guys and they are bad guys. It's time for America to decide and to declare unequivocally, unequivocally, who is who. All right, we're going to take a quick break here. We'll be right back uh, after this break. You're clear. Author, prolific media contributor, PhD in finance. This is the Yaron Brook Show. The Blitz. You're listening to the Yaron Brook Show on the Blaze Radio Network. All right, we're talking Israeli Palestinian conflict, we're talking Jerusalem, we're talking American foreign policy. And so I just want to I just want to be clear here. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict will only be resolved, only be resolved when the Palestinians unequivocally realize, come to completely comprehend that they cannot and will not ever win, that they are that they are more likely to be destroyed than to ever see the day where Israel is wiped out. In other words, there's a war here. And one of the parties has to win. I believe that party should be Israel. Unequivocally, there's no moral equivalency between the Palestinians and the Israelis. There's no, uh, let's arbitrate a dispute between equally worthy partners. No. There is one partner that is seeking peace, that is seeking prosperity for its own people, that is seeking success and achievement and, and human flourishing. And then there's another partner that all he wants is death and destruction. And those are the Palestinians, unfortunately, at least Palestinian leadership and what they have led the Palestinians towards. They have rejected every attempt at peace. I don't believe any negotiation should be engaged in. I don't think the United States should have anything to do with the Palestinians. They should unilaterally, unequivocally declare their support for Israel and tell the Palestinians to shape up if they shape up, if they reject violence, if they turn against their militants, if they turn against the, 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 the suicidal attitudes within their own culture and within their own you know, uh, 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 um, practices, then, only then, only then, once they realize they've been defeated, once they realize they will never be successful, they will never defeat Israel, when they realize that their own culture is, is, uh, is destructive and evil and bad because it emphasizes the role of violence, suicide bombings of little girls. Only when they denounce and reject all that can you sit down and negotiate some kind of deal with them. Only when they reject that can you think about a two-state solution or even a one-state solution, whatever the solution happens to be. But the idea that you negotiate with people committed to, your, to killing you that you negotiate with people who want to destroy you. 
You negotiate with people who are committed to oppressing their own people, never mind oppressing your people. That is the essence of a self-destructive suicidal foreign policy. And that's the foreign policy of the Israeli government that's been negotiating with the Palestinians at least since 1994. And that's the suicidal nature of the American foreign policy under all presidents, including Donald Trump. The fact that he just announced the Jerusalem thing does not change the fact that he has an unprincipled foreign policy, that he still continues this moral ambiguity or moral equivalency between Israel and the Palestinians. And that that is shameful, shameful, and not America first, anti-American, never mind America first. So I want a president who's really willing to be radical, really willing to stand up for freedom and liberty, really willing to be America first. I love America first. I love the idea of America first. But what aches me, what pains me, is that when America first is used as a slogan that is empty, that has no content, that is, that is meaningless, and that's unfortunately what the Trump administration is doing, and it's, it's not just Trump. It was Obama and Bush and almost every one of, uh, and every one of, these, uh, uh, of these presidents. They don't understand what America first is. They have no clue because they don't understand what America represents, which is individualism and liberty, freedom, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness of individuals. And that a foreign policy that is an American first foreign policy is not a foreign policy that treats people who are not morally equal as equal. It is not a foreign policy that is in the UN that has anything to do with an organization like the UN. It is not a foreign policy that has anything to do with the Palestinians and negotiating with Palestinians. Uh, by the way, the, the response to uh, this announcement of moving the embassy is reflective of what the Palestinians are really about. Riots, days of rage, demonstrations, missiles from from the Gaza Strip. What does that anything, have anything to do with anything? Right? What are they trying to gain here? Other than to see some of their people sacrifice, some of their people die, and therefore to, to, to guilt Israel into accommodating them in some way, to guilt the United States into withdrawing their statement. What are they going to achieve by, by, by using violence in response to a, a fact, an historical fact that has existed since 1949 that Israel's capital is in Jerusalem. What, are they, what is violence, how is violence going to solve the, the, the problem that the Palestinians face? They've, they've tried violence, and violence doesn't work in their favor. Violence works, works against them. So every time something happens they don't like, Go out into the streets and, 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 and throw stones or worse and launch missiles from the Gaza Strip. That's going to get you really far. Now, it will because we live in a world, unfortunately, where it's, it's quite likely that the American government will get guilted into withdrawing, that the, uh, you, you, suddenly European countries are going to feel guilty. Oh, my God, people are dying. We can't have that. So we're going to withdraw support of Israel, withdraw support of the United States. Ah, all right. But I, I just wish, I really, really wish uh, that one day I will be able to support an American president in their foreign policy. I so, I, I would love, love, love to be in a position where I would say this president's foreign policy is right or admirable or right in a certain aspect, even right in a certain aspect. But nothing these presidents, from Trump to Obama to Bush at least, to Clinton to Bush Sr., I mean, there were elements at least of, of Reagan's foreign policy that I could respect, particularly his attitude towards the Soviet Union, but other things that he was terrible on. But, but uh, none of these guys since then has even an iota, iota of anything that I can respect when it comes to foreign policy. And Trump, unfortunately, well predictably, is, is no different in some respects. is worse because he claims to be a cowboy. He claims to be out of the box. He claims to be free of all the shackles of conventionality. 
And yet he's just conventional. He's so conventional. His foreign policy is so conventional. Everything he does, you know, once in a while he'll throw out something like this embassy stuff, which is meaningless in the big picture. But but in terms of the essence of his foreign policy, he's completely 100% conventional. There's no difference between him, Obama, or, or Bush. No fundamental differences. He, 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 other than he says outrageous things, and, and they were a little bit more thoughtful in what they said. But in terms of actions, in terms of what the United States is actually doing out in there in the world, you know, you, we forget those American troops who died in Niger. For That's in Africa, by the way. For what? Uh, all those troops fighting alongside the Iraqis to eliminate ISIS so we can hand over that whole territory to Iran. That sounds like a, an Obama policy. That's not America first. The, the lack of support for the Kurds, the one, the one element in that part of the Middle East that is pro-American and we've completely abandoned them as a country. Uh, you know, the, the American leadership has completely abandoned the Kurds. There is no America first strategy coming out of this administration. This administration is a completely, in terms of the actual policies they engage in, is completely 100% conventional, uh, uninteresting, interesting only in, in, um, in, in what's well, the unpredictability of some of the statements that they made, not policy-wise. Policy is, is very predictable and, and, uh, Conventional, very, very, very conventional. All right. Um, uh, remember that the last segment here, we're going to take questions on anything. I know. Uh, so feel free to call in uh, at, at any any time. But uh, during the last segment, we will be uh, taking calls. Uh, and uh, let's see. It's uh, the phone number. You probably want the phone number. It's one eight 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 nine zero zero three three nine three. 1-888-900-3393. And you can call in on pretty much anything. Uh, we're we're going to be taking a break soon. And uh, after the break, I am going to... Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the U.S. economy and uh, switch a little bit. Uh, this foreign policy stuff is a little, uh, is a little depressing. So uh, we're going to switch a little bit and talk about uh, and talk about uh, the economy. So l- let me summarize a little bit of kind of what we've uh, what we've covered here. Generally, it's absolutely the correct policy of the United One States uh, to uh, it's the correct policy of the United States to recognize this Jerusalem as the capital of, of Israel. It's an abomination that this hasn't happened years and years and years ago. Jerusalem is the capital. Israel views it as a capital. Israel is a legitimate, free country that relative to most countries and certainly relative to any country in the Middle East respects individual rights and respect, it respects minority rights, Ready. respects uh, religious rights. And therefore, as a, just, as a, just as a courtesy, it, it, it's its capital should be recognized by all okay. states in the world. Unfortunately, it did not come with a more principled position on general foreign policy, which would have been nice. All right, you're listening okay. to your on book show. We're here on the Blaze Radio Network. We'll be right back after this break. Yaron Brook. All right, I want to switch gears here and, and talk a little bit about the U.S. economy. And uh, we got some decent job numbers on Friday. Uh, I think it was 228,000 uh, new jobs. Um, we, uh, w- w- the economy is still growing. It's, it, it, it's, we'll see at what rate it's growing, but it clearly is still growing. It's the, the U.S. economy has been expanding now for uh, more than eight years, which is for eight years, which is uh, a long expansion period without having a recession, which is uh, fairly unusual. Um, we still got some we still got some issues and we'll get to some of the problems in the US economy. But overall, unemployment rate is 4.1 percent, which is uh, it's, it's some historical low. We'll get to whether that number means as much as it used to mean. Or, or what it exactly means in a minute. But overall, 
the US economy is doing okay. It's not doing gangbusters. It's not doing phenomenal. It's not doing amazing, but it's doing okay. And, and it's worth talking a little bit about why that is, how it could be doing a lot, lot better. And um, what are the risks that we're facing in terms of the US economy? Uh, if you want in on the conversation, 888-900-3393. We're coming up on the last segment of the show in a little bit. I usually have that. You can ask about anything. So you can ask about Bitcoin or you can ask about, I don't know, anything you want to ask about. 888-900-3393 is, uh, is the number. And uh, in the last segment, I'll talk about pretty much anything. So as I said, the US economy is doing pretty well. Um, uh, and um, it, it really is to some extent, amazing that it's doing so well because, uh, uh, you know, the Great Recession of, uh, of, that started exactly, uh, what is it, nine years ago? In, uh, no, 10 years ago, exactly 10 years ago. In December of 2007, that's the official start of the Great Recession. That was a pretty deep recession. It was a pretty devastating recession. And it crushed employment and it crushed pro a, a, a production and productivity has never really rebounded from it. And... Uh, it really, really did a lot of damage to the U.S. It also resulted in a mass of new regulations like Dodd-Frank, uh, so on, particularly on the financial uh, sector. So we had massive new regulations. But since about middle to, of 2009, um, the, uh, the economy has grown slowly, tentatively, uh, wages have not grown very much, uh, uh, and uh, productivity has not grown very much, but the economy seems to be growing, and uh, and that's you know pretty amazing. We've grown, we've done better than than uh, than Europe has. We've done better than most of the world has, um, in the developed world that is. And it's interesting to think about why. And I don't have to get into all the reasons why, uh, but I'd say uh, there there are a few that need to be, uh, need to be addressed. Uh, maybe the most important one is, is the fact that there's something in the American spirit that is entrepreneurial, that is flexible, that can shift and change and adapt and, and accommodate. And even when there are lots of regulations, we, we find ways around regulations. We don't just accept regulations. We, we spend, expend a lot of energy getting around them. We're a flexible economy, and we're a flexible economy primarily because of the genius of individuals, entrepreneurs, who are willing to take risks and to innovate in spite of everything government does. So I, I think that the, the main tribute to job creation and to expanding economy and, and a growing economy is goes to the entrepreneurs. It goes to the business people. It goes to American business that continues unabated, no matter what Washington seems to throw at it, somehow they continue to grow, innovate, create jobs, produce, make stuff. And, and, and that's, that's amazing. And, and Europeans don't have that. It's why Europeans are slower to recover, uh, much harder for them to recover from shocks, much harder for them to, to pivot when there's big, massive technological change. Or, or big regulatory change. Uh, uh, Europe, is it's much harder for them to change. The U.S., much more nimble, much more flexible, and I think primarily because of the entrepreneurial culture we have. And, and by the way, I'm going to say something very unpopular. That entrepreneurial culture is to a large extent, or to a, a, a large extent, fueled by immigrants. Um, and, uh, it, it, you know, the, the, by a, a scientific community that is fueled by immigrants, you know, the 35% of all U.S. Nobel Prizes are won by immigrants. 83% of the finalists in the 2016 Intel Science Talent Search, which is known as the Junior Nobel, are children of immigrants. Um, I'm getting this actually from an op-ed in the New York Times by Beth Stevens, um, that 40% of Fortune 500 companies accounting for 4.8 trillion in revenues, 19 million employees had founders who were immigrants or children of immigrants, that immigrants start businesses at about twice the rates of other Americans, uh, and that we would, our population would not have grown since 1970 if not for immigrants. So a big part of this flexibility is the fact that we have always attracted the best and the brightest and the most entrepreneurial and the risk takers from all over the world who come in, start businesses, 
and 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 in spite of the difficulties and the and the challenges created by government and regulations, they adapt. Okay, so that's the flexibility in the U.S. economy that to some extent is driven by, by immigration. The second reason the U.S. economy is doing well is global growth. Other countries are doing well right now, particularly uh, developing countries. India, China's doing okay, but India's going even faster than China. A lot of Asian countries, even African, some African countries are doing fairly well. Um, the growth of and the increased impact of markets, of semi-capitalist economies out there in the world, of, of the, the continuing destruction of statism, uh, socialism in much of the developing world, and an increase in respect for markets, it's still, still out there, it still happens. Has increased growth rates in these economies, increased growth rates in these countries, could be much, much higher, could be much, much better. And it's because of that, uh, we are exporting a lot more. Export is up, even though our trade deficit might be expanding. We are exporting more, which creates more economic activity in the United States. The fact that we're importing more is also a good thing. It means that we're getting cheaper and cheaper products from overseas, which means we have more and more capital to invest. It also means that foreigners have dollars. Those dollars have to flow back into the U.S. They flow back into the U.S. as investment dollars. So, they, so the fact that we as Americans don't save and don't invest is compensated for by foreigners who, because they have dollars because we have bought their stuff, invest those dollars in the United States and, 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 and grow our economy by doing so. So uh, investment continues by foreigners in spite of the fact that we, because we don't save, uh, are investing little. Um, so global growth has played a big role here. Even Europe now is doing fairly well in terms of economic growth. And, and there's a bunch of reasons for why that is, but, but even there. Um, deregulation under Trump has probably played a role in, in, in the background. So some industries, now not all industries, and I, I talked earlier this week on one of the shows that I did, one of the podcasts I did on the fact that the Treasury Department is actually becoming a huge advocate of Dodd-Frank and actually want to use Dodd-Frank more than even Obama administration did. So, I mean, the, the Trump administration is sending mixed signals on deregulation. But I think in some industries there's been deregulation. I think the message of deregulation has gotten out to business leaders. They are optimistic about the prospects of deregulation and as a consequence are in, engaging in investments and, and uh, expansion. We'll see the evidence on the role of deregulation in this economic expansion right now is mixed. We will see if that's true. I think the prospects of tax reform, lowering capital gains taxes also might be having a positive impact here. I would also add, in addition, uh, the, the central banks pumping money into the economies over the last 10 years, over the last 10 years, has had an impact on nominal economic growth and what we're seeing is economic growth now. Now, whether that is a healthy thing or not, I doubt it. Whether that's healthy economic growth, I doubt, because usually what happens when that happens is you have to pay the piper with some significant recession or some significant decline um, later on. But, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it, the fact is that so far part of this growth is fueled by, you know, the fact that there's money being pumped into the system. Uh, that, that's true of uh, the developing markets, uh, it's certainly true in China and in Japan. Uh, Japan's a developed market, of course. It's it, true in the United States and true in, uh, in Europe that it's it's kind of this loose monetary standard. But of course, part of the problem of adding central banks is we don't know what would have happened in a free market. We don't know what a proper monetary policy would look like. A Federal Reserve, a Federal Reserve, a central bank distorts all that. So I'm, I'm a believer in a free banking system where interest rates and, and money get determined by banks and by free banks, not by central banks, not by central planners of any kind. I don't believe in central planning because it doesn't work and it's rights violating. It, it, it intrudes on the freedoms of individuals. But it could be a responsible part of this expansion to the extent that it is, it will probably have negative consequences down the road. That is, in, by creating bubbles or creating, uh, creating mal what Austrian economists call malinvestment. 
investment in industries we should not be investing, investing in products that the market does not really demand, that the de demand for them is actually artificial. And then the recession comes along and corrects for that and eliminates that malinvestment, of course, if we allow the recession to happen. So the economy is going for all those reasons. Um, there are quite a few risks involved here. And uh, what I want to do is when I get back from the break, we're going to take a quick break here. When I get back, talk about those risks, talk about the risk the, the, the economy is facing. I also want to take this call from Kevin uh, from Wisconsin. And any other calls, uh, any other questions uh, that you all uh, might have, we'll do that right after the break. You're listening to Iran Book Show on the Blaze Radio Network. We'll be right back. This is the Yaron Brook Show. All right, we're back, and uh, in uh, in this part of the show, uh, I take uh, I take your calls. So uh, feel free to call in. Uh, with questions, it's 1-888-900-3393, one 3393 Now, let me quickly mention what I think are the biggest risks to this uh, e economic expansion. Then I'm going to take a call from Kevin and then uh, any other calls if anybody else wants to call in. Um, I think the biggest risk short term is probably uh, protectionism. It's uh, Donald Trump's anti-trade attitude. It's threatening. Uh, it, it's if we really... Uh, do something like withdraw from NAFTA or, or seriously damage NAFTA, or if we withdraw from any of the of the trade deals that we have, uh, I, I think it would be a, a massive economic disaster that, that would have massive negative implications on the United States and our economy and jobs on, on any kind of economic expansion. And, and look, jobs are not as good as the numbers say, but they're not bad. They're not bad. Um, I also think uh, I also think this attitude towards immigration is a real risk to uh, continued economic expansion. Uh, the fact that the Republicans are proposing to cut in half legal immigration. Now, I, I agree with them about shifting away from family re reunification towards a job-based uh, Im legal immigration policy. But why cut in half? Let's just get double the number of people coming in based on jobs and shrink the number of people coming in based on uh, family. I mean, I would like to see a massive expansion of job-based immigration into this country, H-1Bs, any kind of any kind of immigration that's based on, on work and jobs, I think should be expanded. I think by, by restricting immigration, uh, we, are, we are destroying um, our ability to be flexible, to, to build, to change, to, to innovate, uh, we'll have a less flexible uh, labor force will have labor shortages uh, coming down the pike, particularly of skilled labor. Uh, but labor shortages across the board, I expect to have if we continue with our attack on immigration. And then finally, probably the biggest, uh, the biggest risk. Well, one big risk is financial regulation. The fact that the Justice Department, the Treasury Department, is is big on regulating uh, banks and regulating financial institutions, and actually wants to increase their power to regulate. That is scary. And finally, central bankers are probably the biggest risk ultimately uh, in terms of uh, long-term, short-term, middle-term because of the somewhat randomness of their actions. Uh, I could see easily the Federal Reserve raising interest rates to higher than what they should otherwise be, and, and uh, that could trigger, the will probably trigger the next recession. Um, but, you know, let's talk about all that. Another time. In the meantime, we're going to take this call from Kevin. Hi, Kevin. You're on the Euron Book Show. What's up? Thank you for sure. taking my call. My sir. pleasure. Can you hear me good? I, I can. I can hear you great. Okay. I want to go back to something you said because I was listening to the um, what some of most most of what I knew when you were talking about the history of the Israelites and finding the homeland, finding the safety net, finding the place they can protect themselves. And then um, the president, you know, declares that we as the United States are recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And doing it officially means our military is bound to protect Israel now. No, that's and not when true, you Kevin. Said, when you, when that's you just said not it true. Was meaningless, when you said it was meaningless, I said, what? So I just would ask you, sir, 
Why is it meaningless, that declaration? Well, let me first say that what you said about the military being bound to protect Israel now is just not true. Uh, the fact that we declare a particular country as a, a particular city as being the, uh, the capital of a particular country does not make us bound to protect that country. We, we're not bound to protect China because we recognize Beijing as its capital or to protect France because we recognize uh, Paris as its capital. We're bound to protect France because we're members of NATO. Uh, it, it, there is no treaty between the United States and Israel where the United States is bound to protect Israel. I don't think Israel needs such protection or wants such protection. Uh, Israel can defend itself. All Israel needs is for the United States to stop putting pressure on it, to negotiate with the Palestinians, to try to cut peace deals that are bad for Israel. I think that is what's important. And the fact is that, that all indications are that the president is continuing to use um, uh, diplomacy uh, to try to put pressure on Israel to try to negotiate with the Palestinians. Uh, you know, Rex Tillerson just this morning said this declaration has nothing to do with the final status of, of Jerusalem. Well, it should. The United States should declare unequivocal support for Israel and unequivocal withdrawal of support from the Palestinians. And as long as it doesn't do that, then, yeah, this is symbolically a good thing. And if it had come from, uh, from an administration that had any kind of consistent foreign policy, then I would say it's a good thing. But I don't know what this means when Donald Trump does it, because I don't know what he's going to do tomorrow. I don't think anybody knows what knows what he's going to do tomorrow. He's inconsistent. He's all over the place. And his foreign policy is not consistently pro-Israeli and pro-America. I, I think his foreign policy is very conventional. It's, it's not that different from Obama's or from, uh, or from Bush before him. So... I just don't think it's that big of a deal. It, it it should have been done. It should have been done 70 years ago. It should have been done a long time ago. Go ahead, Kevin. Today, and I thought Tillerson was, like, contradicting the president. No, no. Read read the president's speech from uh, when he announced Jerusalem. I mean, he clearly says this has nothing to do with the fact that we'll recognize the two-state solution if the parties get to that. We encourage the parties to keep negotiating. We will support that negotiation. We're not, in a sense, taking sides in that negotiation. Uh, the speech you know, is full never, of that kind of compromising language, full of it. But that can never happen. You know, there's never going to be a two-party solution because people want to destroy Israel. I, I agree with you. Then why doesn't the president say that? Why doesn't the president Burn. say I think he's learning. He's learning. Well, he surrounded himself by advisors who are not going to help because Mathis and uh, Kelly and uh, I forget the name of the guy who runs the National Security Council. All those generals are not particularly pro-Israel. They're not. They do not have a proper stand on on the Israeli-Palestinian issue. They are much more likely to advocate for compromise and appeasement of the Palestinians and uh, I, I just don't see this foreign policy. I don't see a foreign policy that's coherent yes. coming out of this administration uh, in a way that would reassure me that this declaration about Jerusalem is is really that meaningful. I mean, again, okay. in and of itself, it's the right thing to do. It should have been done a long, long time ago. It's just that, as I've said many, many times on this show, and if you keep listening to me, I will say many, many times in the future, um, it, it, there, is, there is no real understanding of what America first foreign policy really looks like in the Middle East. I see no indication of, of America actually pursuing unequivocally its self-interest in the Middle East. I see appeasement. I see Russia uh, being Russia and Iran as the two parties that have benefited the most from the Trump administration's policies in the Middle East. And Iran is clearly an enemy of the United States, and Russia is no friend of ours. One minute. Um, so I, I, I just see, uh, I don't know, uh, meandering, pragmatism, uh, uh, unprincipled uh, policies, and therefore I just don't see, I just don't see that this Jerusalem thing is, is that meaningful. Now, again, I think the Palestinian response to it is very indicative of the fact that if, if, if the Palestinians wanted peace, here's, here's a good indication the Palestinian wants peace. If the Palestinians wanted peace, they would recognize Jerusalem as 30. the capital of a state called Israel. Just like Sadat went to Jerusalem. 
and, and talk to the Knesset, the Palestinians would recognize Jerusalem. That would mean they want peace. That would be an indication, and I would change my position on that. All right. Uh, we're coming to the close here. Thank you all uh, for listening. Thank you, Kevin, for calling. And uh, we're here every Saturday at 12 o'clock Eastern Time on the Iran Brook Show on the Blaze Radio Network. See you You're next week. To the Iran Brook Show. You're clear. Thanks. Thanks.